Great. Good morning, everybody. This is this is our last day uh, together, um, and we have a couple of uh, talks on the future. Um, so uh, uh, this morning, uh, first by uh, our, our first talk is uh, by Madulika Kuhatakorta, who is our um, our fearless leader here here at the summer school. Uh, Madalika has been, some of you have interacted with her already. She has been uh, at NASA headquarters for a, a, a major part of her career. Um, recently, you were seconded to Ames, but is, has that changed? Are you back? I'm back. I've been back, back. For, uh, for a year now. Excellent. All right. Um, and back. has been influential in shaping uh, the NASA heliophysics um, science uh, throughout her career, and uh, and uh, at least part of that that her legacy is this summer school. So, I will uh, turn it over to Lika uh, for her talk. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you, Nick, especially for all that you have done in bringing young people into the field and really coaching them in ways sometimes, um, you know, our deans, myself included in that, uh, can't do as well. So we are definitely indebted to you and the younger generation should be too. Um, what I wanted to do today uh, is normally I don't give a heliophysics division update. Uh, at the summer school, but try to add something new whenever I have given talk in the past. But there's so much going on in the division that it seemed like it would be appropriate to actually give you sort of a snapshot in time where the division is. And I think it's even more fitting after the discussion uh, we had yesterday from all the questions um, that you asked and all the ideas that you presented uh, for uh, you know, the future of heliophysics uh, science, whether through the decadal process or uh, any other. And where we are in the division is that lot of ideas which were like seedlings maybe five years ago are actually turning out to be, um, you know, uh, real budding um, plants. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And you will see as I go through this uh, presentation, um, some of your ideas are actually something I think the division has already captured and moving forward. That doesn't mean you're off the hook. You need to continue to be engaged, shape, right, do all of that. You know, it, it's like democracy. If you want to shape a science, you have to be an active member and an active participant. No one else is doing this. We are all in it together. Oh, so I can't say next slide. I have to do this. Uh, let me see. Yes. So th th this, is, this is Heliophysics Systems Observatory has been the most vibrant uh, of all times when we started this some, uh, you know, the whole concept about 15, 16 years ago. And as you can see, we have um, 20 operating missions with 27 spacecraft because some of them are multi-spacecraft mission, uh, mission in development, 11 missions in formulation. And we have all this key decision point activity going on which is when we finalize our ideas of mission going from one phase to another. And that's happening on a weekly basis. So these numbers may be already a uh, little bit uh, dated. And you, you can kind of always go and pick your favorite mission in this whole panoply of um, spacecraft that we have. So it's, it's, it's really a very exciting time in the division. Ah, so this is, I didn't even realize, you can see all of the missions that are actually in formulation showed up as uh, bright yellow. 
and there are quite a few there. Parker Solar Probe, I think you guys already know, heard uh, there were some talks in which Parker science was discussed. Um, Parker uh, Solar Probe is not only breaking engineering records, you know, people kind of know it for that, right? Everyday people, uh, it, it's the fastest spacecraft, closest spacecraft, all that. But we are beginning to break some science boundaries too. Are we there completely? Of course not. It's a seven year plus one year prime mission. So we need all the data we have asked for in order to make some of the breakthrough science that we have described in, in our planning process. But what Parker is already trying to show us is that the observations are incredible, exquisite. And therefore, as we gather data, we are finding new areas of science. That's what happens when you go to a new vantage point and start taking observations. You find out uh, sort of new questions to ask and new signs to answer, like dust-free zone, for example, like the switchbacks we are seeing, you know, changing uh, magnetic polarity, but having to connect them now to the surface of the sun. So there's just lots of interesting stuff going on. And as I give this presentation, what I'd like to say is that what I have done here, I have like 13, 14 charts on the heliophysics update, and then another 10 or so on talking about um, introducing you to what we could be doing with artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. If I have time, I will go over that quickly, but I wanted to capture everything. So even if I don't finish and run out of time, you will have this information in one place. And how, how can I not show this? So this just happened last week on 18th of uh, June. Uh, US Postal Service actually re released a forever stamps uh, for the SDO mission, which has completed one solar cycle. And SDO is the cornerstone mission of the Living with a Star program that I oversaw for a long time. But not only that, it also provides the context for everything else we see. You know, often a lot of our missions are taking in situ particle data. That is a point measurement. How do you connect it to the big global picture is always the question. And SDO does that uh, remarkably. And I felt that the, the release of these stamps is kind of one uh, form of outreach that cannot be matched by anything else. This can reach everyone in the US and globally. And I'd say you should go get your book of stamps while you can. Now, I uh, know that- Can I interrupt for a minute? Yes. So we have a, a question from uh, uh, Regu about uh, uh, plans for extended mission for a Parker Solar Probe. Oh, oh, all those are, you know, they are such details, Raghu. I am not going to address it in detail, but we have a process called senior review. So when the mission comes out of prime phase, then we go through the senior review process. And that's why you saw when I showed you the uh, Heliophysics Systems Observatory that there are many operating missions. Operating missions go through the process of senior review. But if a mission is in prime phase, then it's doing its uh, level one science. So Parker's time will come, but not yet. When is when is Parker's prime phase uh, done? Prime, prime phase, as I remember, remember I kind of left this group about three, four years ago. My The original plan was seven years. And exactly at what pace the senior review will happen, I'm not sure. But we can most certainly uh, find that out and send that to you. OK. Thank you. Sure. So th 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 there were concepts of new missions that I saw that uh, many of you proposed uh, yesterday. So solar cruiser tech demo 
is one such uh, concept that is being enabled and it what it does it, it enables sub l1 heliophysics and solar storm monitoring and this is very important both for doing science you know to see how shocks and turbulence evolve from the inner to outer corona into L1. And we typically have had a really large gap between L1 and uh, inner heliosphere. And a sub L1 measurement can remedy that both in terms of connecting the signs, how coherent these structures are, but also for space weather, it's a huge uh, advantage because we could now get an idea of the busy component, which really determines at the end whether the a solar storm that comes from the so, uh, sun will be a geospace storm where a lot of the space weather applications are happening. So we can go from 30 minutes, you know, to close to an hour or more, depending on where it's uh, located. This is a quick update on research and uh, analysis uh, portfolio. Uh, we have actually, as um, Dana and I, we were talking about the decadal planning process too. We have a very vibrant RNA program right now. And it, it really uh, owes a great deal of gratitude to the previous decadal survey that proposed the drive concept which eventually kind of increased our RNA budget. And so heliophysics is now more adventurous in doing comparative heliophysics. Now in the summer school, you know, every year we add different topics. And so comparative uh, heliophysics is the fourth book that was created from this summer school. So you will see what that is. And we are entertaining uh, topics, you know, as further and remote from the sun as possible, like exoplanets, because a lot of the underlying physics of the connection of a star and a planet is done in great detail in heliophysics. So we, we are really at a great place. And you know, to the consternation of many, I always used to say, haven't had an opportunity because I haven't seen anybody in a while that, you know, Physics are us should be the heliophysics logo, kind of like Toys R Us, backward R. But, but this is where a lot of the fundamental signs of planetary uh, signs or earth signs or even astrophysics, other than cosmology, you know, galactic astronomy, we, we do a lot of that. We are also embracing early career investigation program really keeping all of you in mind. These, these were being done uh, few and far between, like the Jack Eddy Fellows, for example, you can see uh, last selection of Jack Eddy Fellows uh, from uh, 2020. But we are also introducing other competitive programs in that area. And citizen science is another area where we have dabbled in the past, but now we are actually taking active steps to make it more formal and see how we can actually not only get some science done through citizen science, but also kind of get our science out to people like astrophysicists have done or like uh, earth science folks have done. And of course, you know that uh, there's going to be a couple of uh, solar eclipses, actually three. There's one this year in December in Antarctica, but the 2024 eclipse is going to be as big or actually even bigger uh, in its uh, science capabilities, which will be visible from a big swath of uh, US land. So continuing on uh, use of yes. I think there's some background noise, if you can mute, please. Uh, there are some new uh, or restructured uh, program elements here for the ones who are interested in proposing or whose mentors propose to the 
programs we uh, you can you can see the parker solar probe guest investigator golden icon guest investigator technology and instrument development for science so again i would like to point to you some of the concepts you were uh, uh, raising yesterday some of those we have heard before and have tried to address that in different ways there's low cost access to space through suborbital rocket, CubeSats, uh, increasing the number of flight opportunities. Um, and uh, so that this is from 20, Roses 20. The new Roses call has uh, Living with the Star tools and methods that I introduced, but which is focusing on tools and methods utilizing the tools of artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. Want to see what? kind of appetite is out there in the community and how do we shape this area. And then there is GDC, interdisciplinary science. GDC is a new mission concept. Interdisciplinary science for eclipse, another thing that I have been championing. And this is for the eclipse in Antarctica on 4th of uh, December. Uh, there's heliophysics mission concept studies going on in parallel because of the decadal um, uh, activity. And, and then the last one is again something that I have initiated, and many of you probably don't know what uh, this is. This is called heliophysics innovation for technology and science. And this is the only call in heliophysics RNA program that doesn't have a deadline. You know, so there are a lot of ideas that community comes up with, which doesn't fall into any particular of the traditional calls we have. So what do you do with those? So we are kind of going out and seeking these innovative concepts that can be funded on a continual basis. And you can submit your ideas and proposal to this call anytime, basically. Space weather, we uh, continue to hear quite a bit about space weather. Space weather has been an active ingredient. I, I call it the applied side of heliophysics science. Uh, there have been a lot of recent accomplishments, you know, NASA space weather strategy and implementation plan has been completed, NOAA and DOD framework to transition NASA research techniques and technology relevant to space weather operations is going on. These are things Living with the Star program has supported over the last two decades. And they are actually beginning to kind of see their true home where um, applicable. Not going to go through reading all of this, but again, uh, space weather uh, activities and partnership with other agencies, including international agencies, is uh, um, it, it's um, increasing rapidly. This is the planning for the next decade. So you kind of, um, I think Nick and Dana talked a little bit about the decadal process. So keeping that in mind, Heliophysics had our 2050 workshop in early May. 2021, and I hope some of you actually attended the workshop. Unfortunately, I have had parallel meetings going on for the past two, three months, and I wasn't able to attend, but I have heard a lot of good things um, about the meeting. Inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. I think this is, this is a topic close to heart of everyone, including heliophysics, including this current administration, NASA as an agency, heliophysics division as an entity within that are actively um, soliciting ideas and pursuing strategies to really meet the goal. Uh, and uh, your ideas that we discussed yesterday, you know, it doesn't stop here because we are pursuing, right? We have to continue to be mindful and uh, shape uh, this activity. And this is the heliophysics division, um, you know, sort of uh, looking ahead. You can see there is a list of missions beyond 2021, and you might find your favorite mission here. There, there are missions of every flavor. Hormis is a lunar gateway mission with in-situ 
observations of particles and fields and radiation. PUNCH is a polarimetric mission of the inner heliosphere to L1 that will be imaging the solar wind and connecting what hasn't been connected. And this will be really a great contributor to Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter. IMAP, you know, again, another L1 mission, which is going to follow on, um, you know, beyond the tradition of IBEX, looking at energetic particles. Uh, we have tracers, um, atmospheric mission. We have sunrise, it's a radio observation. I forget what escapade is. So remember, these are so many new missions and I have, I'm still kind of absorbing all the new things that's going on in the division. Again, I would say that maintaining a healthy RNA program through early career investigator program is very important. Suborbital, which is the low cost access to space, including CubeSat, maintaining the drive initiative. These, these are pretty fundamental. And then you can see that we are also trying to do scientific return by connecting uh, missions to other agencies or Helio Science um, Connect, for example, Helio Physics Systems Observatory Connect, where you can kind of do connected science by, through, you know, treating all of your spacecraft as one great observatory. So this is, this is kind of uh, the message to all of you, get involved and stay involved. Uh, Nikki uh, Fox, who is the division director of Heliophysics, sends out periodic notes. I think you should sign up for that and you'll get a lot of information there. And then there are some strategies in, you know, how to get um, involved in Heliophysics activities and also know what's happening at headquarters. And of course, you will always make the day of a program scientist if you volunteer to be either a panel member or an executive secretary. Executive secretaries are people who don't vote in a panel but support the chair of the panel. And you get to learn a lot as a young person how the process, the review process and proposal writing process goes on um, at NASA. And I would urge you to consider that. And then finally, you know, uh, I wanted to share something that I had started working on 15, uh, not 15, five years ago. And I, I just got this commentary out in Space uh, Weather and Space Climate Journal, Everyday Space Weather. And too often, you know, we always kind of take space weather in the context of a big storm. It, it's like, you know, hurricanes or tornadoes, uh, for um, terrestrial weather, but terrestrial weather doesn't stop there. There is a everyday weather, right? We look at our app to see whether it's going to be sunny, cloudy. Do I take an umbrella? Do I take my jacket? Well, there is also an everyday space weather that's happening all the time that just doesn't get the visibility. So I thought I will write this commentary and it's published. You can take a look at what some of these concepts are of everyday space weather. And I'd say sort of contribute to this idea base, you know, so that space weather uh, really becomes sort of uh, very similar to what Earth weather is today. Because even though we live on this planet, we are heavily vested on our technology for our day-to-day -day life, right? And that's where space weather plays a very dominant role. And you can see how it affects us. And um, I, I don't know, so I see the time is uh, 1127. Should I just quickly go through this uh, machine learning kind of top level ideas and then take questions? I'm asking you, Nick. Uh, yes, I was uh, trying to find my mute. Yes, I think that's fine. Okay. okay. So, um, you know, I've been talking about uh, machine learning. This is a big uh, area for future, I believe. And I'm kind of trying to shape uh, the a program around that. So I'll kind of, since 
machine learning wasn't discussed at all. I'll just kind of give you very top level sort of ideas. And um, many of you already probably know all of this, so uh, bear with me. But I wanted to at least capture some thinking here. So, you know, machine learning essentially evolved from artificial intelligence in the 80s. So it's not a new topic for many of us. All of you were not born then, but many of us were, and this started but didn't advance where it is today. And there are reasons for it. And uh, ML is very much database uh, training machines to recognize human-like connections, right? Neural net. And deep learning is simply sort of a deeper form of machine learning. It utilizes more intricate algorithms and techniques that allow the ML models to function more naturally with the, uh, without the human uh, involvement. So I'm giving you just kind of very basic sort of uh, framework. You know, I mean, it, it's kind of a connected um, uh, approach. You know, it starts with data collection, data pre-processing, model training, model evaluation, improving performance. And I, I kind of focus this along the space weather topic. There are, you can do discovery science with machine learning as we are recognizing. Uh, there are four types of common MLDL learning types. You know, these are kind of how you approach your data, supervise where a pre-labeled data set exists, and there's some human supervision. There's semi-supervised, which is supervised, but without pre-labeled data. So they get, uh, sorry, they get progressively more difficult in terms of algorithm development as we go to the right. Then there is unsupervised, unlabeled data set, no instructions during um, experiment. And then there is reinforcement. This is the big thing. The human can change, alter the learning environment to test results. And a lot of these are going to be absolutely vital for exploration of deep space and really utilizing the decades of data that not only we heliophysics have collected, NASA and other agencies that have gone underutilized. Uh, techniques and algorithms are, are methods used to implement support and or you know, uh, otherwise alter uh, MLDL model. And, and so these are again, sort of uh, almost kind of statistical techniques for lack of a better word, but these are the algorithms that we are developing. So there's regression analysis, there's classification of data, there is clustering that you can do, depending on the kind of data, how you ask the questions, and then uh, dimensionality reduction. And uh, this is already getting sort of in the complicated zone, but I gave you a little bit of uh, overview there, you know, how these are being used. And the goal is that we have all these choices to choose from when we are actually trying to do say space weather prediction. Deep learning is currently the fastest growing and most promising field of AI ML. And you can see, you know, artificial intelligence is this big sphere with a subset of that is machine learning and deep learning is in there. And there are again, descriptions of what um, AI, machine learning and deep learning can do. We, we can, oh, yeah. yeah, so so there's a question in chat. I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but the, um, the question is from Megan, what does it mean for data to be labeled in this context? That, that that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I'm kind of sad that I don't have a good chart on that, but there are many charts um, actually where you have um, actually given a designation. So when you collected the data, you know what type of data this is, where it was taken, all of that. So when you look at a question of, is it a cat or not a cat kind of examples that exist or a, a, you know, a muffin or the face of a dog, 
these are unlabeled data sets, which you go through the process of labeling basically, because you didn't know before whether a face is a face. But then you have data where you actually know, you might know, um, uh, you know, a sunspot, but even there you might not know its um, extent, for example. Sorry, I'm not giving, there are uh, very nice cogent, uh, coherent ways of describing this. And I wish I had a nice slide on that. But you can find it, just Google it, you will find it. So the, these are some of the uh, differences between machine learning and deep learning. Uh, machine learning uses algorithms in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so, often involves a human in the loop that influences the model prior to running the actual trial experiment. And, and machine learning is what I see heliophysics community is using a lot. Deep learning is a class of machine learning that uses more network layers to extract high level features from data. So deep learning becomes very useful when you have a lot of imaging data. For example, solar dynamics observatory AIA images lend very well to deep learning techniques. Each layer transforms its uh, data into a more sort of abstract representation. Deep learning models have no human interaction once the data is inputted and are generally much more able to detect new connections and patterns in the data. So this is a really fascinating area of discovery where you can, by choosing the right kind of data, asking the right question and working with computer scientists, you are in discovery space basically, where you can um, see patterns emerge that our human brains would not have been able to figure out on its own, but the machine can. And then you can go back and interrogate that with physics approaches. So some advantages and disadvantages of the two, you know, in ML, it easily identifies trends and patterns, no human intervention uh, uh, needed, continuous improvement, handling multidimensional data, and multi-variety data, which is again the case in heliophysics. So we go from remote sensing data on the sun to in situ particle, magnetic field. I mean, think of the whole host of data and different vantage points from which we are collecting data, assembling them. That is the multi-dimensional, uh, multi-variety data basically. Disadvantages are that needs high volume data. So a lot of data, if you do not have sufficient amount of data, the results you get, it's kind of in that way, a little bit like statistics, right? After all, I think machine learning AI is nothing but fancy statistics. And we have given it this name, AI, and everyone is afraid and thinks that it is a black box and we don't understand anything about it. I would say uh, AI should be labeled as augmented intelligence and not artificial intelligence because we have created the mathematical foundation for it. And, and it's, it's much like with telescopes, we can see uh, a universe that we can't see with the unaided eyes basically, or with microscope, we see the cell structure, they, they are, augmenting, enhancing our perception, our senses. So AI is augmented intelligence, basically. Um, what are the key challenges, of course, uh, and then this is keeping space weather in mind, the data problem, what is the minimal information required to make a forecast? This problem determines the failure or success of any machine learning application, as I was talking about. The gray box problem, gray boxes are essentially hybrid or mixed AI models. So for space weather, how can we best understand the large amount of data in the sun earth system? The surrogate problem as many ML models are really quite complex and difficult to understand, which is what we have labeled as black box. 
uh, how can surrogate or simpler models help translate difficult space weather data? And in here, I'd like to kind of throw out an example to you, right? We, we, have, we have developed a bias towards AI uh, as being something that cannot be understood or a black box that we don't understand, therefore don't believe. On the contrary, if you think about all the sophisticated models that are coming from a high-end computing platform, right? We individually don't go verify all of that, yet we believe in them. So we have to get to that level of trust with AI also. The uncertainty problem, space weather largely forecasts in terms of single point predictions, and there's a clear need to understand and assess the uncertainty associated to this prediction. And this is true not only just for AI, this is true actually for all of space weather prediction, any way we approach it. And then too often to quiet problems, space weather data is typically imbalanced, right? We have a handful of solar X flares, and therefore it becomes difficult to really address that problem. The knowledge discovery problem. How do we distill some knowledge from a machine learning model and improve our understanding of a given system? You know, th these are kind of ideas I am putting out there. We can, you've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty close to the end. So th this kind of gives you the current state of machine learning in heliophysics and space weather. Um, and, uh, you know, some comments from uh, some of the pioneers and experts in our field, like Monica uh, looks at um, the sun and solar data. And this is a comment from her observing the sun from different perspectives and multiple perspectives is the most meaningful way to improve flare prediction using machine learning models. Okay, now on the left hand side, what I have are some of the research activities that we are uh, supporting, giving you some examples of books that you can peruse through uh, the ones who are interested in this field. This also gives you uh, space weather uh, machine learning publication growth. So you can see how the field uh, of uh, publication is accelerating. And this is, this is captured uh, on the uh, left-hand side up to 2015. And then you see um, this moving on to 2020. And I've given you the references where these results have been published. So you can clearly see the acceleration and utilization of these tools and techniques. These are again, some examples of machine learning in space weather, you know, uh, machine learning um, as threat assessment tool tracks the severity of CMEs, we are doing that. Uh, the Frontier Development Lab uh, has a tool tracking the sun's extreme ultraviolet irradiance through deep learning. That was a pretty amazing result. Another one, again, from FDL is using a supervised probabilistic model to predict um, sunspots. Uh, again, these require good quality data over a long period of time. Yet another one is convolution neural network studying solar magnetic field uh, images and super resolving them. So basically going over the last say, 20 to 40 years and looking at ground-based uh, magnetic field data to very high resolution magnetic field data like Hinode and see if we can super resolve these smaller um, chunks of data into the same resolution, say, as HMI on SDO or um, Hinote. And the results are pretty amazing. But these are, you know, this work is done typically over two months in summer. There's a lot to be done. And this is my last slide. So this is sort of space ML. So the uh, SETI Institute and the Frontier Development Lab essentially announced the launch of spaceml.org. I urge you to go to that website and see 
kind of what space ML is. It's a resource that makes AI ready data sets available to researchers working in, in this uh, domain. And, uh, and, and then you can begin to experiment at least with the heliophysics bucket of data that exists there. And with that, I thank you very much. And um, I am ready for more questions if I can answer them. Thanks so much, Lika. Uh, let's give Lika a nice round of applause. So he can do jazz hands or whatever. Great. Uh, questions for Lika? Everyone is just tired. <laughs> so uh, yesterday we had the project where uh, we got together and discussed uh, the decadal survey. Uh, have you submitted anything regarding that? Or do you, what are your thoughts on where we need to be going in the next 10 years? My personal thoughts? <laughs> well, that's a very challenging question for a program scientist because we, 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 we have, have to end before midnight tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I missed what you said. Um, personally, I don't know. I think um, we, we really need to um, start utilizing the data we have collected, even as we think of uh, future missions, because there is a lot of science um, waiting to be um, exposed, for lack of a better word, through these tools and techniques. In a way, we could not do through a single BI research method. Um, I, I am really sort of supercharged about that and focused on figuring out how do we generate those topics that would benefit from the application of these tools and techniques because not every kind of science will benefit. You know, the, the, the fundamental way we do science continues on, but this becomes like a subset, just like, you know, artificial intelligence is a big bucket in which deep learning is a smaller subset. So I, I think that there is a lot more science to be done utilizing high-end computing platform, uh, combining them with AI ML tools, both for heliophysics uh, predictive capability and discovery space, because there's just so much we don't know still. Thank you. Other questions for Lika? Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Lika. And uh, I'm sure other people will have questions uh, uh, and we can always uh, uh, get them to you in, in uh, a variety of, um, of ways. Um, I as think, I mentioned oh. before, that uh, feel free to get in touch with me, send me ideas or questions, uh, please do so. Great. Um, Catherine, we wanna try and do a uh, picture. I'll be taking the picture, Nick. Um, if everyone can turn on their webcams, please. Except for me. All right, just waiting for a few folks to get their webcams on. Everyone make yourself look presentable. I'm, try I'm trying to call the sun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the human head occulter. We got to get right. Jesse in here. Uh, just Justin in. Uh, there we go. Okay. <coughs> ready? We've got two more webcams, Dinesh and Justin. I'll turn mine on. Oh, there's Justin. There's Justin. All right. 
And we've got Dinesh's headshot. So uh, that's, that's good. Probably- we got him. So, all right, I'm going to start taking pictures. I'll take about 10 of them. Everybody smile. You guys want to do one with a hand up? Maybe? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. That's a good one. <laughs> one, do you, one, do you, uh, like a pull face? Can we yeah, pull? Sure. Face? If you guys want to rubber face it up, go ahead. <laughs> All right. And that one All will right. go. I get some of these. So. All right. I think that's probably enough. I would say. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you all. That's uh, that will that will go on the Facebook page. Oh, that reminds me. Um, you know what? I'll put a link to it. So we do have a Heliophysics Facebook page. Um, well, there's both a Heliophysics Science Facebook page and a uh, Summer School Facebook page. I will put a link to the Summer School Facebook page, um, so that uh, that's one way to keep in touch and also a way to uh, contact to see. Who uh, former people and new people that are coming in, so um, and so we can uh, uh, connect across the years uh, that way. So I'll put a link in that, and if you are um, don't object to um, uh, Facebook too much, you can uh, join them and uh, and and uh, continue to participate in the in the community that way. So um, I think we're on a ten minute break now. Am I right? Yep, you're muted, Catherine. Sorry, um, Elena has actually joined us for our next lecture. So, uh, right, are we? Are we? Should we have been starting now? Or sorry, when? No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, we are on a ten minute break. Uh, if you we are on top of the hour. Yes, the okay, hour, yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I wanted didn't wanted to make sure I wasn't confused. All right, great. Top of the hour. So take a ten minute break. Um, and Elena. Uh, uh, Pro- Provnikova will uh, talk to us about interstellar probe in ten minutes. Summer school. For our last talk at the summer school, uh, we've got Elena Pro- Provnikova um, from uh, John Hopkins in the Applied Physics Lab, uh, and she is going to talk about what I, I when I first heard about this, I thought it was just the coolest idea. Um, that we're planning a mission that will launch for 10 years from now that will start getting data till 20 years from now. Uh, and so she's going to talk about interstellar probe. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. All right, you see my first title slide, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, so as Nick already introduced me, uh, I'm Elena from Johns Hopkins APL. Uh, I'm a lead for heliosphere and interstellar medium science for this interstellar probe mission concept. I also do other projects. Um, I'm doing simulations of the uh, solar wind coming from the from the sun, uh, solar wind in the inner heliosphere, and um, my PhD was um, on um, global modeling of the heliosphere, interaction of the solar wind with the interstellar medium, and how this global structure, global heliosphere, responds to uh, variable input from the sun. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and present to you uh, the concept of this uh, future mission. And in this presentation, I will talk about the science goals and uh, mission architecture design and instruments. And before we dive into details, I would like to take you on a journey. So our sun is just one of 100 billion stars in the galaxy. And during its evolution, the sun and its protective magnetic bubble, the heliosphere, uh, has completed nearly 20 revolutions around the core of our galaxy. And uh, during this solar journey, uh, the sun with its heliosphere uh, plowed through very uh, different interstellar environments that all have shaped the system, the solar system, the heliosphere we live in today. Uh, The orders of magnitude differences in, in properties in different interstellar uh, regions have had dramatic consequence for the 
penetration of this interstellar material inside the heliosphere that we all are made of. And um, those processes, they ha have affected elemental and isotopic abundances and atmospheric evolution um, in bodies of the solar system and conditions for uh, habitability. As far as we know, only some uh, some 60,000 years ago, the sun entered what we call the local interstellar cloud that you see on this slide uh, here in the middle, sort of this big fuzzy area that called local cloud. And now the heliosphere is approaching the edge of the cloud. And um, in a matter of some thousand of years, uh, we will find ourselves being completely outside of this local cloud and will enter some different interstellar environment. We don't really know what's, what's ahead of the sun, um, sun sort of journey in the interstellar space. So in a sense, uh, there is a galactic event that's about to happen, um, that the sun will transition from one interstellar region to another. And, and this transition and previous transitions shaping the continued evolution of our uh, heliosphere. So interaction of our sun with the local interstellar cloud creates uh, the boundary, uh, the boundary region. And I think uh, Marath Offer gave, uh, already talked about this, uh, this school. Uh, so Voyager 1 and 2 uh, space missions um, sent a unique in situ measurements from that complex boundary region um, from the heliosphere. And Voyager has made remarkable discoveries, but left many, many questions uh, unanswered, and we still do not understand what's going on at the boundary of the heliosphere. An interstellar probe is the uh, pragmatic concept for the future mission with a 50-year design life uh, that would take us out to 400 astronomical units from the sun uh, with conventional technologies that we have today, and uh, likely the spacecraft will travel even to larger distances from the sun. So, as I said, the only two missions that uh, visited the heliosphere boundary and made uh, in situ measurements were Voyagers 1 and 2. And uh, Voyagers actually discovered and theoretically uh, discovered the boundary of the heliosphere that was predicted theoretically before and uh, brought many great discoveries. And uh, this image from uh, the paper by uh, Tom Kermiges uh, and others from 2019, uh, nicely summarizes um, all the discoveries that Voyager 1 and 2 made, as you can see. So Voyager 1 went about, uh, crossed the heliosphere boundary uh, at um, about 30 degrees above the ecliptic and Voyager 2 about 30 degrees below the ecliptic. And uh, so the inner boundary of this, let's, let's talk on terminology a little bit so that we're not lost here. Uh, so the inner, uh, inner boundary of this shell is called the termination shock. So this is the uh, boundary where the fast, the supersonic solar wind decelerates to, um, as we thought, subsonic speed. I will talk about this more. And um, then the outer boundary of this shell is the helipause. And this is the, boundary that actually separates um, the material coming from the sun and material, um, the interstellar material surrounding the heliosphere. Um, so originally, voyagers were planned as the planetary missions, and they had lim limited payload and limited capabilities to fully explore the fundamental physics of this complex region. For example, voyagers uh, did not measure um, distribution of particles or uh, peak appliance, or uh, it had insufficient sensitivity of the magnetic field measurements in the helio sheath, did not have electron measurements. So there are a lot of measurements that we don't have. And uh, voyagers will likely last until 170 astronomical units from the sun um, with uh, gradual switching off of instruments and will only provide sort of glimpses of what is happening in that interstellar medium outside of the heliosphere. And Voyager's discovered a very unusual plasma regime at the heliosphere boundary, which is dominated by energetic particles. And um, some of the very unexpected discoveries came that the, this, this, the, the thickness of this shell that you see on this image, the sort of purple shell, is just 30 astronomical units thick. And this is um, 
while all the models predicted the thickness about 60 astronomical units. So all the existing models were off by a factor of two. Um, also, Voyager 1 and 2, uh, the plasma uh, measurements on Voyager 1 and 2 showed that the, the plasma flows in these two, uh, along these two trajectories are uh, very different, and we still cannot match uh, those flows with, uh, with our models. We don't really understand why the plasma flow behaved the way it did. Um, also, when two spacecraft crossed the helipods, um, it came as a as an very unexpected that this boundary is actually not uh, as a per perfect tangential discontinuity surface as we always thought about this. We always explain it this way. In fact, Voyager showed that the heliopause is is sort of porous structure, and uh, there are particles from the from the sun leaving the heliosphere through the heliopause, and particles uh, interstellar particles actually can come in. Uh, through the heliopause into the heliosphere. Uh, also, IBEX and uh, Cassini missions have imaged this global interaction uh, between the, the, the heliosphere and interstellar medium from inside. Um, they measured uh, fluxes of energetic neutral atoms in different energy ranges. And the two missions have brought, um, under, have brought a lot of interesting data, but we still, um, Sorry, um, but we still uh, do not understand what what actually what what is that global uh, structure and the global shape of our heliosphere. And there are other missions, uh, uh, also SOHO and Ulysses and New Horizons, that also brought a lot of information of, on interstellar material, although very limited information and um, how interstellar material interacts with the heliosphere. And uh, I'm sure you all know that the future mission IMAP that uh, will be launched in February 2025 will provide order of magnitude better uh, ENA imaging capabilities from one astronomical unit. So there will be a spacecraft with, uh, I think, 10 instruments orbiting L1 point and measuring uh, energetic neutral atoms from everywhere in the heliosphere and, and at the boundary. And um, this mission, of course, will make a lot of discoveries and will guide further in formulation of the interstellar probe uh, science investigation. So, uh, so what is the interstellar probe? Uh, since the beginning of the space age, uh, people dreamed of going to uh, another star. And since 1960, scientists have discussed um, of going beyond our heliosphere to the unexplored interstellar space. Uh, we are not going to another star, uh, but interstellar probe is the first step to the space um, uh, between stars. Interstellar probe will travel through the heliosphere boundary into the uh, interstellar medium to at least uh, 400 astronomical units from the sun and um, uh, likely will go uh, further. Uh, we are not a starship. Uh, interstellar probe will be the large uh, strategic mission that uses available technologies uh, to achieve asymptotic speeds by a factor of two, three greater than those of Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft. So that allows us to get to the boundary of the heliosphere faster and actually exit the heliosphere and um, start making measurements of the interstellar space. Uh, so the compelling science about the nature of the global heliosphere remained with us over decades and completely enabled by going to the new unexplored place, the interstellar medium. And for the first time, we will discover how the heliosphere which is the only habitable astrosphere we know today, uh, how it actually looks from outside, what is that its shape and, and how this shape, uh, we can then sort of understand how this shape evolve as the sun goes through the different regions um, in the interstellar medium. Uh, there are also unique opportunities for, on such mission, there are also unique opportunities for um, um, other fields, for planetary science and for astrophysics. Uh, for example, uh, the flybys of small planet or Kuiper belt object in the outer solar system, uh, or uh, doing measurements of the extragalactic background light uh, once the spacecraft leaves the dust uh, cloud around the sun. And lastly, interstellar probe uh, paves the way for, uh, for the next steps on longer interstellar journeys um, in many different ways, and scientifically, technically, and uh, programmatically. Uh, so we are 
now at the final year of the four-year feasibility study of such mission funded by NASA and led by Johns Hopkins and PL. Um, and so in this study, we use uh, so-called pragmatic approach, meaning that uh, all technology that enabled this mission uh, to fly, they, they're ready for launch by 2030. And also uh, the capability, uh, the mission capability to operate and downlink out to um, uh, 1000 AU has to be in place today. And, and we do have those technologies. And also the mission lifetime is no less than 50 years. Um, and uh, in this study, we also use the sort of menu approach, um, meaning that we are looking at what can be done by such space mission. What are the science questions that we can answer? What are the trades in, in operation? How, how the spacecraft would operate and what kind of measurements we can do? So this sort of a menu, menu approach so that, so that the future a science definition team who will actually work on execution of this mission, they can look at all the trades that we've done and, and make choices. Uh, what I will present you today is the result of the uh, large community uh, effort uh, organized across eight science working groups. And uh, it's amazing to sort of remember that uh, we started in 2018 from uh, 65 participants in the first interstellar probe workshop. Then we grew to 90 and then uh, to 250 um, people registered for the workshop last year. And today we are pushing forward 500 mem members around the globe who support um, this idea. And it's really incredible to see the momentum and uh, the people coming with different uh, ideas for this mission. Uh, so, there are three goals. Um, so yeah, now let's talk. Uh, let's talk more about uh, science. Focus on 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 the science for such mission. Uh, there are three goals for the interstellar probe mission, and uh, the primary goal is uh, the heliophysics goal to explore uh, the unique interaction um, responsible for upholding the boundary of the heliosphere, which is also applicable to um, other astrospheres in our galaxy. And um, of course, beyond the heliosphere, the unexplored interstellar medium is completely new territory. And uh, this is decisive for the heliospheric interaction. Um, the way how, how heliosphere looks and its, its structure and dynamics, it uh, depends greatly on, on the conditions around the sun and the conditions in the interstellar medium where sun uh, goes through. Uh, and as I said, uh, on the trajectory leaving the solar system, there are other opportunities besides heliophysics. So there are two supporting goals, as you see on this slide. There is planetary supporting goal and astrophysics supporting goal. For planetary science, this is um, ex exploration of small planets and Kuiper belt objects be uh, beyond Neptune. Um, for example, flyby observations um, and will enable huge step forward in understanding of uh, those distant worlds. I'm sure you all know uh, the great discoveries that New Horizons made when they did flyby of Pluto and then later um, of this sort of snowman object MU69. Um, also, once the interstellar probe is outside the dust cloud, astrophysics has a unique opportunity to see the extra galactic background light from uh, early galaxies and uh, uh, early stars. And from, uh, our, from our planet, from one AU, from the sun, we cannot see that, uh, that light because we're, uh, it, it masked by, by, the, by the dust cloud. We cannot see it. So now let me dive more into details for the heliophysics uh, science objectives for the mission. And Elena, yeah. can, uh, sorry, interrupt with one question. I think you, know, you kind of covered this already in this slide, but you know, the question was about opportunities for outer planet uh, flybys and yeah exactly oh. yes so uh, one of the idea that uh, we are looking at is to do um, well I'm I'm not sure the question is the flyby of like the solar system planets or the small dwarf planets oh, uh, oh. so flybys for a proposed mission around some outer planet slash moons on its way to the yeah. is okay yeah. Yeah, so here we're talking about uh, flybys, um, maybe one or two flybys of the small dwarf planet. Uh, for example, one of the 
um, sort of target being considered is the dwarf planet called Quiowar, which, uh, which uh, we never visited. Uh, we only have this fuzzy image from Hubble of this object, but it's um, well aligned in terms of you know, launch date and, and Jupiter gravity assist and uh, the direction we want to fly out from the heliosphere. So it, it's sort of one of the good opportunities to do flyby. Um, so, yeah, so now let's, uh, I hope that answers the question uh, and I'm happy to talk more later. So now let's um, go into more details for the heliophysics science questions for the mission. Uh, so the first, uh, so within the heliophysics science goal, there is a three science objectives. So the first objective is to determine the physical processes that shape the heliosphere and um, how those processes manifest themselves. So the shape of the heliosphere, um, as I mentioned before, whether it's more like uh, a comet-like with an extended tail, or it has a sort of a bubble shape, or it uh, has a croissant shape, uh, the shape remains one of the hottest debates in the community. And uh, Ibex and uh, Cassini data, and you see here, so on the left upper plot, you see a uh, sort of image from uh, Ibex, uh, Ibex mission and on, on the bottom, you see uh, the results of the uh, Cassini Inca um, uh, data. Uh, so the two missions have revealed what we know to date about the heliospheric shape. Uh, so the IBEX data suggests that the heliosphere has uh, elongated tail. Uh, although I think there's a very recent publication uh, shows that, that shows uh, that the heliosphere is more like sort of elongated bubble or, or something like this. Um, and Cassini data suggests that the heliosphere is, is more like a like compact sort of bubble confined by the strong interstellar magnetic field. So both missions um, made observations from vantage point uh, inside the heliosphere and they suggest sort of different uh, interpretations, different shapes. And our best uh, state-of-the-art models that we have uh, also do not agree about the shape of the heliosphere. For example, I'm sure Mirab showed a her simulation that suggests that the heliosphere has a croissant shape. And um, there are other groups who suggest that the heliosphere um, has very long tail that extends out to a thousand astronomical units from the sun. Um, so the global imaging, so the, the solution to this uh, sort of debate is um, to do the imaging from vantage point outside the heliosphere. So going to a very large distances from the sun and um, turn your ENA camera to the heliosphere and take an image um, of the heliosphere. This would be the um, sort of decisive way to understand the global structure. And uh, here on the middle of the slide, you see uh, the simulation uh, that was performed using output from uh, Offer et al, uh, Miraf's Offer et al model. And this is how heliosphere would look like in, um, in imaging data from the interstellar probe taken from two, 250 astronomical units from the sun. Um, so, also, as I said before, Voyager has encountered completely new plasma regime uh, in the, at the heliosphere boundary, in the heliosphere specifically, the region between determination shock and heliopause. Uh, they showed that the pressure is dominated by particles with energies larger than thermal, so-called pickup ions, with the energies of a few uh, kilo electron volts. So Voyagers did not measure pickup ions, leaving a gap in our understanding of this critical particle population and uh, what's their role in upholding the heliosphere. And uh, measurements of particle distributions from thermal to superthermal and, and measurements of uh, fields on the interstellar probe enable to determine energy partitioning and pressure across the termination shock, heliosheath, and heliopause. So, the termination shock was indeed um, the first signature of the heliosphere edge. And uh, this, this is the largest shock in the heliosphere. And it, we all expected that this would be the strongest shock. But um, observed changes in uh, plasma and magnetic field and energetic particles at the shock transition were completely unexpected. Um, in that 
the shock actually it turned out that the shock actually is is um, is sort of weak and um, also the expected heating of the solar wind plasma across the termination shock was almost uh, absent and uh, so here you see um, on on the plot uh, on the uh, on the left upper plot you see um, the data uh, so the crosses show the Voyager data and um, the diamonds. Uh, so the crosses show the Voyager data from uh, termination shock crossing and the diamonds show the crossing from the bow shock, bow shock around Jupiter. And uh, so the main sort of takeaway message here is that the, uh, as you, if you compare the temperature uh, on the right side of this plot, um, which is, you know, um, downstream downstream the shock you can see that um, the temperature in the helices was um, much smaller than we would expect for the uh, for the strong shock uh, so next sort of mystery is the um, acceleration of anomalous cosmic rays uh, when anomalous cosmic rays were discovered by voyagers uh, we all expected the termination shock uh, since that's the largest shock in the heliosphere is also the efficient accelerator and particles that uh, an, an anomalous cosmic rays are particles that start from the interstellar neutrals they get ionized and accelerated to tens of mev uh, of energies however what we saw is that termination shock um, did accelerate particles but not to the high energies that were absorbed in the helio sheets and in fact as voyagers crossed the termination shock and went further into the helio sheet the intensities of anomalous cosmic rays continue to roll um, uh, to, uh, to roll to increase. Uh, so, with measurements of particle distributions and fields on the interstellar probe, we will be able to distinguish between uh, current theories and hypotheses how anomalous cosmic rays are accelerated in the heliosphere. Whether this takes place in the flanks um, of the of the termination shock or by turbulence in the heli sheath or by or by reconnection or uh, some maybe some maybe some other process that we don't uh, yet understand uh, so another mystery from voyagers is that uh, the heliopause is not the surface but rather a boundary with, with complex interactions uh, between heliospheric energetic particles and particles coming from the interstellar space and one of the open questions is what is the structure and nature of the heliopause? Are there instabilities playing a role or what kind of instabilities and how the heliospheric uh, particles escape? And uh, here on the middle, you see the simulation from Pagarello et al. And um, you see that they produced uh, some sort of instabilities in, in that boundary between uh, yellow and blue. So this is the, the heliopause. Um, also, when Voyagers went into the interstellar space. We expected that uh, um, the, the, the direction of the magnetic field outside the heliosphere uh, would be different from the heliospheric uh, magnetic field direction. However, uh, it occurred that the direction of the interstellar field outside the heliosphere appeared to be the same. That was a huge surprise. And uh, we still do not understand um, completely this effect of the magnetic draping of the heliosphere um, from outside this is still one of the um, one of the mystery so now uh, let's move to the uh, second objective uh, the second objective is to determine how the sun's activity and the interstellar medium and its possible inhomogeneities influence the dynamics and evolution of the global heliosphere um, so the Global interaction is highly dynamic and responds to changes in the solar wind dynamic pressure with the solar cycle. And uh, here on the left uh, upper plot, uh, you see IBEX high imaging, um, uh, IBEX high imaging data that shows the global interaction from, um, this is the data taken from one of you. Um, and uh, here you see the maps for the entire solar cycle, almost entire solar cycle. Uh, you see how ENA maps change brightness and structures during the, uh, the solar cycle. Uh, on the interstellar probe, we will leave the heliosphere. Uh, we will image the heliosphere evolution under very different solar conditions in, in the future solar cycles. And we will actually cover about five solar cycles 
to see how, 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 how the heliosphere dynamics uh, evolve with different solar cycles. <clears throat> So on the right uh, upper plot, um, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, uh, I'm showing here the, the results of the simulations from Vashimi et al. Uh, 2011. And uh, they, they show that the flows in the helio sheath um, can be highly dynamic with a lot of variations. And there could be uh, a lot of, um, so if you, if you look at this sort of, red um, disturbances that come from the heliosphere and they uh, disturb the uh, termination shock uh, boundary. They go further into the heliosheath and propagate to the heliopause and also reflect back into the uh, heliosheath. So this all creates very dynamic flows um, in, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the heliosphere boundary with waves uh, propagation and reflection and uh, boundaries oscillating in response to pressure pulses. But it's not only the sun that controls the dynamics of the heliosphere, it's also the interstellar medium. And um, uh, so regions with different uh, densities of um, atomic hydrogen in the interstellar medium uh, could create, uh, could have a strong effect uh, on, the, on the size and shape of the global heliosphere. And here on the plots on the bottom, you see uh, simulations of the heliosphere in two different cases. Uh, the one is uh, when the sun travels through the very dense and cold cloud. Uh, and this simulation is actually shows how small the heliosphere could be with the, dis uh, with the distance to the heliosphere boundary, the heliopause being uh, 34 astronomical units. And um, on the right plot, uh, uh, they consider sort of another extreme case when the sun is traveling through the very hot uh, fully ionized plasma with a temperature of about a um, million degrees and that shows how huge the heliosphere could be that the heliopause stands at about 300 astronomical units from the sun. Uh, so detailed measurements of uh, at the boundary and in the local interstellar medium on interstellar probe will help us to understand uh, how the heliosphere would respond once the sun encounters different environments in the interstellar medium. Uh, so another uh, great discovery from Voyagers is that shock waves um, uh, actually propagate in the interstellar medium. And those shock waves, they have very different nature than shocks we observe uh, in the heliosphere. Uh, so here on the right, you see the plasma wave observations from Voyager 1, from Voyager 1, sorry. Um, uh, so what you see here is that the frequency and so the uh, sort of red blobs, uh, those are shocks. And uh, you can see how they correspond to the measurements of the magnetic field shown on the bottom plot. Uh, so those are actually shocks in the local interstellar medium. And this was um, unexpected because everybody thought, well, the interstellar medium is very quiet. Like what, what, what can you expect to have in, uh, what kind of disturbances you can expect in the interstellar medium? Uh, we don't know the origin of those shocks, but they're certainly related uh, to the disturbances launched by the sun. Uh, for example, coronal mass ejections that you see um, on this video. I'm trying to play this again. Um, uh, so the coronal mass ejections, they're launched at the sun and uh, they travel to larger distances. Uh, they merge together, they interact, and sometimes they form sort of big uh, structure that called uh, global merged uh, interaction regions. And they propagate further beyond the heliosphere uh, boundary. And possibly this is what uh, creates those shocks that uh, we see in the, uh, in the Voyager data. And the biggest question is how far uh, the shocks in the interstellar medium can propagate, or in other words, how far the influence of our sun extends uh, in the interstellar medium. So the third objective is to discover and quantify directly the properties of the unexplored local interstellar medium, such as properties such as uh, neutral gas and plasma density and temperature and composition and properties of interstellar dust and particle distributions and turbulence in the magnetic field. And we can go um, on and on. So 
the local interstellar medium is completely new area for exploration and uh, discovery. We have very limited uh, information about the um, interstellar gas. Uh, from uh, so what we know is uh, information obtained from the uh, line of sight spectra toward different stars, and uh, from these observations we have sort of a global uh, view of the interstellar medium at the scales of light years. And uh, here on the image on the left, you see uh, our sun. Uh, well, this is uh, similar to the image I showed before. You see the bright uh, sun, and there is this so, sort of a map um, of the uh, uh, local clouds surrounding the sun. And recent studies suggest that the heliosphere is actually in contact with four interstellar clouds with different properties and uh, as I said before, leaving the local interstellar cloud within relatively short galactic time scales. But uh, the ground truth about the properties of the interstellar gas is missing. We, we, don't, we don't have that information. We only have the sparse understanding from indirect measurements we, uh, we've done from the heliosphere. Uh, so the first step into this unexplored region of space would offer the first sampling of particles, fields, and dust that hold the key to understanding the heliospheric interaction. Uh, so once we, once the space, the inter spacecraft, interstellar probe, um, exit the heliosphere, uh, the first very interesting structure that uh, it will encounter uh, in the interstellar, very local interstellar medium is the hydrogen wall. Uh, uh, which is shown here on the left. This is the result of the global simulation. Uh, so this, uh, this shows the excess of hydrogen density uh, around uh, the heliosphere. So how hydrogen wall is formed? So you have uh, interstellar gas coming to the, uh, well, you have sun going through the interstellar medium. And uh, so the plasma, decelerates, the interstellar plasma decelerates as it goes around the heliosphere. And because of the charge exchange process between plasma protons and interstellar neutral particles, uh, those particles get decelerated and they get heated. So you have this, this region around the heliosphere with decelerated and heated um, hydrogen atoms. Uh, hydrogen wall was predicted by global models in late 90s. Um, and uh, in fact, hydrogen wall was discovered as excess of absorption in Lyman alpha spectra toward uh, different stars. And similar absorption for, uh, also was discovered from other astrospheres, which suggests that hydrogen wall is the uh, generic astrospheric phenomena. And it's not just hydrogen wall, there is also uh, oxygen wall. Um, but we never observed this um, structure in situ. Uh, we never observed density of neutral atoms. We don't, we don't know what's the density of neutral atoms in this region, what's their temperature and velocity, and, and what its spatial uh, structure. Uh, so with, with the uh, measurements of, on interstellar probe, uh, specifically the um, measurements on neutral mass spectrometer and uh, um, measuring uh, emission coming from, from the hydrogen atoms, we will be able to um, uh, uh, and to get these properties. Uh, we're just beginning to understand the role of um, interstellar dust uh, in, in the global structure of the heliosphere and how dust uh, propagate inside, uh, how it deflects uh, the heliosphere boundary. And also there is a huge disconnect between interstellar dust measurements. Uh, there are very few measurements that we have from remote sensing and um, and in situ. Uh, interstellar probe will provide the ground truth by directly measuring the size distribution and elemental composition of the local interstellar, uh, interstellar dust. Uh, interstellar probe also opens unique opportunity for the new cosmic ray science. Uh, the, this is, so the completely unexplored um, part of the galactic cosmic ray spectrum is below one uh, uh, GeV. So above one GeV, uh, galactic cosmic rays, they don't care about the heliosphere, they can, uh, they can be absorbed at Earth, but below 1 GeV, they're shielded by the heliosphere and can only be studied uh, beyond, um, beyond the heliopause. 
And measurements of elemental and isotopic abundances of galactic cosmic rays will enable to distinguish between different sources of galactic cosmic rays and understand elemental fractionation and spallation in the interstellar medium. Uh, so now um, let's talk about the operation uh, of this mission. Uh, so as I said, the nature of this study is the uh, trade analysis. So uh, to define the useful trade space, we have to uh, we have two different uh, mission architectures, a baseline and uh, augmentation. So the baseline is uh, completely driven by the heliophysics uh, primary goal, by the uh, heliophysics science questions. And the augmented uh, scenario satisfies also the desire for uh, flyby of Kuiper Belt object and astrophysics observations. Uh, I won't talk about augmented scenario in this presentation and I'll just focus on, uh, on the baseline. So shortly after launch, uh, the spacecraft will spin up and deploy booms and antennas and uh, measurements uh, start already in the inner heliosphere to understand the formation of pica pines that later become uh, critical in the force balance at the heliosphere boundary. Uh, imaging makes, makes use of changing vantage point on the southward trajectory to get um, handhold of the 3D structure before exiting the heliosphere. So once uh, reaching the boundary, uh, after about, uh, so we will reach the boundary after about 12 years uh, after launch. Uh, the, with the dedicated payload, we will spend about five years uh, in the heliosheath region uh, between the termination shock and heliopause, and eventually cross the helios, uh, uh, eventually cross the heliopause into the interstellar uh, space where interstellar phase uh, will begin. And this is where we will um, start exploring for the first time the uh, uh, existence of the, uh, the and properties of the hydrogen wall and um, uh, possible bow shock or bow wave um, beyond the heliosphere, the extent of those, those heliospheric perturbation and shock waves uh, propagating in the interstellar medium. And we'll take the first image of the heliosphere from outside. And then uh, interstellar probe will set out into the unknown ocean of the space between stars. Uh, so to make sure, uh, I know this is a very busy slide, but just to show you, um, to make sure that we, uh, uh, we capture all the science uh, to the pragmatic design, we uh, finalize the huge uh, science traceability matrix for, uh, for both baseline and augmented uh, in, uh, uh, mission scenarios. Uh, of course, this is very condensed uh, version uh, and all versions can be found uh, on the website, uh, which I posted um, into the chat. Uh, so starting from the left, there are science goals and objectives that we talked about. Um, then we go through the detailed uh, measurement objectives and um, measurement requirements and going to mission requirements in terms of um, distance, time, and uh, trajectory. And also I would like to show you the, uh, the payload. Uh, so what instruments the mission uh, is going to carry. So this is the list for the uh, heliophysics baseline. Uh, uh, so the, in this case, the spacecraft would be uh, a sun pointer spinner. Uh, so in the list of the instruments, you can see the uh, magnetometer, the plasma waves uh, subsystem, the, um, uh, the plasma measurements, pickup ions and energetic particles and cosmic rays, interstellar dust analyzer and uh, neutral mass spectrometer and um, measuring um, ENAs, ENA camera to measure ENAs and uh, also the uh, Lyman alpha instrument to measure a uh, spectra of backscattered Lyman alpha background. Uh, and here is actually the spacecraft. Uh, this is the first uh, rendering and um, a snapshot of the current design. Several details are still being discussed uh, and uh, finalized by the engineers. Um, so this is the, the design that uh, looks similar to Voyager spacecraft and there is no uh, co coincidence here. Um, so the layout is largely driven by the uh, large high gain antenna, which is um, five meter in, di in diameter in this case. Uh, and there are particle instruments on uh, sort of rigid 
extensions to uh, avoid obscuration of the antenna dish. Um, so as you can see, there are no um, uh, solar sails, uh, no flyby, flying reactors, and no fusion drives. It's all, it's all um, today's technology and uh, modern, reliable spacecraft that we can build um, today. And uh, I think my time is almost up, so uh, let me just uh, uh, wrap up. Um, it's it's really. As, as I think about the interstellar probe, it's it's really extraordinary, extraordinary mission. It's uh, it marks the beginning of the humanity journey into the um, space between stars. Uh, we are there technically to take this first step into this um, into the interstellar medium. Um, interstellar probe uh, interstellar probe will take us to um, the completely unexplored region uh, beyond our um, our heliosphere. To understand our cosmic home uh, in space, our, our heliosphere, and find answers um, that we don't know even how to pose today, maybe. And I would like just to um, uh, to draw your attention and encourage you to uh, join the team. If you go to our website, uh, there is a there is a tab community and join, so you will receive uh, different newsletters about. Uh, different events related to the interstellar probe, such as uh, sessions at the conferences, and uh, there will be uh, interstellar probe exploration workshop. Uh, it's open to everybody uh, from September 27 to uh, October 1st uh, this year. Uh, we are working on the uh, student program, so this is um, um, uh, on the way. Uh, there, are, there is a number of white papers that are being prepared for the heliophysics decadal. Um, the white papers uh, discuss uh, those open questions and um, mysteries that we touched on in this presentation. And um, uh, we have um, week, sort of bi-weekly tag up on those white papers. And I heard many times that lead authors uh, they want to engage students and postdocs, but they don't know how. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, go to this link uh, where some of the white papers, uh, white paper proposals have been posted. And uh, you can, if you're interested in those white papers in the topic, you can just uh, let, know, uh, let the author know and uh, um, join the discussions that are going on this summer. And uh, this AG, fall AGU, uh, we propose the session on the interstellar probe. Um, I think this is the fifth session in a row. So please um, check it out. And I think I'll stop here and uh, can answer questions. All right, let's uh, thank Elena, please. So rounds of applause. Thank you all very much for listening. Zoom applause. Yes, great. OK. Um, yes, yeah, so questions for Elena. So uh, uh, Mahith was asking about the supernova and whether the image was captured by the Hubble. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you uh, know about that. And then we'll get other questions. The one, uh, the one I showed. The one I showed when I talked about the cosmic rays. Yo, there. The other this one. one. Yep. I'm I'm actually trying to remember whether it's Spitzer or Hubble. I think it's Spitzer telescope, but I have to double check. Okay. Um I have a while well, students are thinking about their questions, I have a question. What is the trajectory relative to like either, I mean, whoever's model you want to pick, but say Marav's model, um, no. what is the trajectory of, of stellar probe in that model? Well, this is a great question, Nick, and I actually have a slide on this. <laughs> <laughs> I came prepared, you, you can, see? You can, you can you know, send, me, send me the check later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is probably too complicated plot. Uh, let's not go into uh, details, but I just wanted to say that we looked at different uh, uh, trajectories, uh, different sort of fly out directions. <coughs> and, uh, we looked at, you know, what signs you gain, what signs you lose uh, 
uh, as you go along the, these different uh, uh, directions. Uh, so for the baseline mission concept that I talked about, uh, we picked the 45 degrees off the nose of the heliosphere. So the nose of the heliosphere is if you're looking toward the direction uh, of the incoming interstellar wind, right? Uh, so if you take 45 degrees to the side in ecliptic plane, so this is the direction, um, so a little bit off the nose, basically. This is the direction for the baseline uh, mission concept. And uh, the advantage here is that uh, going this way, we will go right through the uh, ribbon, which is the uh, bright uh, ENA structure on the sky map from the um, IBEX observations. Uh, we still don't fully understand what are the processes behind this ribbon and going through, through the ribbon we, with, with instrumentation to make in situ measurements, we hope we will understand what creates this ribbon. Um, and also this direction is good for imaging the heliosphere from outside. Um, and we, uh, we've done preliminary simulations on that. So you sort of, you leave the heli, I mean, if you go right to the nose and uh, turn your camera back and take an image of the heliosphere, it would be hard to say, uh, you know, what the tail looks like, right? Because you're seeing, you're looking right at the, at the front. Uh, if you look, if you go a little bit to the side and uh, take a picture, then uh, we will be able to sort of distinguish between different uh, concepts for the heliosphere shape. Um, we also, as you can see from this table on the right, we uh, also looked at the direction to go right through the nose. Uh, and this is the uh, fastest way to get to the local interstellar medium. Uh, uh, there is also, um, there are other interesting things here, such as the stagnation region. So you go through the region where sort of the flow from the sun, the, the solar wind flow from the sun, it sort of stops, right? And the wind from outside stops. So you go through the stagnation region, which uh, was never explored before. Uh, we also looked, as you can see, uh, going uh, right to the flank, 19, 90 degrees from the nose, and even going to the uh, to the tail. And uh, this is a very it's it's ex very exciting for many people, for many scientists. But the biggest uh, sort of worry here is that we will never get to the um, sort of interstellar gas because perhaps heliosphere has a very long you know, tail, you have a mixture of interstellar material and solar material, you will never get to the interstellar uh, gas. And uh, uh, yeah, so in terms of numbers, how fast we're going to go, uh, the current estimates is 7.6 astronomical units per year, uh, which is two, three times larger than Voyager 1. Uh, great, thank you. Other questions for Elena from uh, the group? Either either put them in chat or just chime up. Elena, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I had a couple things I had to do here. I'm not sure if you covered this. Uh, what's the idea for the uh, orbit? How will you get get out of the solar system so fast? Uh, great question, Dana. Um, so. The there are two things here is the very heavy rocket and uh, the uh, design uh, includes the using the SLS rocket, uh, the heavy with, with sort of the heavy, uh, heavy rocket that uh, gives a huge boost as it uh, 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 during launch. And also, well, that's the wrong slide, but basically, I don't have a slide for that. Um, and uh, we're going to do the uh, powered uh, gravity assist uh, at Jupiter, and that gives that gives that speed. Uh, there yeah. is there is other um, there is other uh, idea that have been considered, but I know there are a lot of risks from engineering side, like uh, going back to the sun and uh, uh, do the uh, flyby. Uh, at the sun at very uh, close distance, even closer than uh, Parker Solar Probe will reach. But I know that there are a lot of risks uh, associated with this scenario. And uh, one of them is that we have to carry 
a very heavy uh, heat shield with us to um, to protect in, uh, instruments and spacecraft from from the sun. Okay, yeah, but uh, off Jupiter then. No, yeah, 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 just the power uh, gravity assist at Jupiter. But That's wouldn't it. Jupiter gravity assist kind of really? give you a lot of radiation. I mean, that's always a concern, right? Yeah, that's right, Lika. Um, I don't have very detailed answer to that, but I know that uh, our engineers are aware of that. Uh, so they, they, they know, um, I think they know how, how, to, how to go around of this. So that's, that, that's definitely something that they keep in mind. Thanks. Pauline's got a question in chat. Which uh, would the high speed negatively affect the spatial cadence of the measurements? Well, the the speed uh, which is achieved here, the um, sort of between seven and eight astronomical units per year, this is the sort of a sweet spot because you go through this uh, very uh, you know, the most interesting region, the heliosheath region, right, be between termination shock and, and heliopause, we know that this region is about 30 astronomical units thick. So you, you cross this region um, in, in about five years. <coughs> yeah, four to five years. And uh, that's, that's enough time to spend in, in this interesting region. So that's, that's, that speed is sort of the uh, sweet spot here. What do, you, what do you expect your data cadence will be on the order of magnitude? So if we, I think this is in, in the table with the instruments. Um, yeah, for example, yeah, it's about 60 seconds. You can see here under the measurement requirements for magnetometer, we require about 60 seconds. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the, that's the number here. Okay. And we're gonna, yeah, and we're gonna go with the um, 50, 50 kilometers per second. Yeah, so I don't think that there is any uh, sort of negative effect here in terms of cadence. And uh, Florian is going back to the beginning of the talk. He asks um, what the, um, how many years the mission uh, is the pl the mission planning the primary lifetime the primary mission planning is uh, so the lifetime of fifty years and with this speed it gives that's us the primary mission or that's the primary mission yes fifty years yes yeah think about voyagers uh, voyagers have been there for forty five years now about forty five years and they got to one hundred fifty astronomical units and in Interstellar probe will get to 400 astronomical units in 50 years. Some of us were excited kids when Voyager launched. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, uh, any any other questions for Elena? Um, I had a question, Nick. Um, hi, Elena. Thank you for a great talk. Um, I know that current missions and um, missions that are some missions that are being planned do these um, op have these opportunities for early career folks to like join the telecon and have like a mentoring opportunity. Um, is that something that um, Interstellar Probe has? Is that what you were alluding to with the student programs? So we will we will definitely have uh, some kind of program and probably more than one and. Uh, for the student program, we we just beginning to sort of formulate the, the student program, and uh, the reason that it's not uh, fully developed yet is that because it was just not the part of this particular concept study. Because the the goal of the study is more like, you know, look at if it's if it makes sense to do this mission, you know, and what you can do. So the student program just was not really the part of the initial goal but we saw a lot of interest from students at the last workshop uh, so for now i would really encourage you to um you know to join at the website 
and you will be receiving uh, links to different events and all events we do they're open so you can always call in um, and uh, we plan workshop this fall and there will be a student some sort of a student um, um, you know activity during that workshop because last year we had uh, we had two hours for students just for students and uh, we had the short presentations for students and then they were doing some activities on mirror board with their ideas and, and what they liked, what they think, uh, what ideas they have, and, and so on. So that would be my advice. Great, thank you. I, I think this is one where you don't wait to be invited. You just kind of show up and start. Right. Yes, please do. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to put it, Nick, yes. All right. Um, I think we should transition into our break slash office hours now. So, I, Elena, I don't know if you need a break or if... Um... No, I'm great. I don't need okay. a break. Good. Okay, great. Um, if uh, uh, we are going to start back up, um, let's say let's start back up at 1130 for our wrap up session. So at, at half past the hour. Um, and... Uh, for the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, Elena will be around to answer other questions. Uh, oh, and uh, and I'm sorry, Lika will be around as well. So I think uh, Catherine has, will create uh, breakout rooms for uh, Lika and Elena. Yep, um, so I have those rooms and uh, Nick, Damon and Amitava, I do have a private room for you as well if you would like to uh, discuss. What we're doing next. Correct. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the rooms are open now. Okay, great. <laughs> 